Hey everyone, good morning. I'm excited to tell you about the research that's going, been going on in the imaging platform, and I hope that through the course of this talk you'll get some ideas of how imaging might be used in your research, even if you don't normally touch a microscope. Um, so uh, the talk is about how to get the most out of your images. And we'll begin with um, just the basic concept that images contain a wealth of quantitative information. It's not just looking at it by eye and making conclusions in a qualitative fashion, but it's a, a, it's a rich source of quantitative data. And what's nice about images is that they are compatible with a lot of complex model systems, so not just cultured cells, but more complex systems. It's a single cell resolution technology, it's quantitative, and it's multiplexed. I'll go through those four first to set the stage. So complex model systems can be quantified by imaging, and this includes um, not just single cells growing in dishes, but more complex cell types like neurons and co-cultures, as well as tissue and organoids, uh, whole organisms like C. elegans and zebrafish that can be studied in, in high throughput, and as well multi-dimensional images like movies and um, three-dimensional imagery. All of these contain a vast amount of quantitative information that we can extract uh, these days using automated approaches. Secondly, microscopy offers single cell re resolution. I hope I won't offend all the um, single cell RNA-seq folks by saying that microscopy has been so since the 1600s. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of experience uh, thinking about cells as a heterogeneous mixture. Um, and uh, even more so over time. So image analysis is quantitative, um, and here I want to drive the point home with a specific project. This was John Crispino from Northwestern University, was interested in, in a particular type of leukemia, and he wanted to figure out if he could find any compounds that would cause these cells to become polyploid. And so uh, here's what the cells look like with their DNA stain, and the software has, um, has circled each individual nucleus. And a positive control here causes the cells to replicate their DNA but not divide, and so you see these gigantic nuclei. Of course, by eye you can say they're bigger, but by image analysis you can precisely quantify the DNA content. So here, um, the negative controls have two peaks, a 2N and 4N DNA content, so before and after replication. And you can see in this positive control, it's not just that they're, big, that they're bigger, but in, if we quantify the amount of DNA intensity within each of these nuclei, we get these very nice 8 and 16 and 32N peaks um, because it's a log scale. So in this particular case, it allowed them to identify compounds, um, and a clinical trial was launched in October um, of 2015 for... Uh, a drug that they found that they hypothesize will be helpful against this particular type of leukemia. But again, it's very quantitative um, uh, technology, and then um, it's multiplex. So first of all, you can use multiple stains in a fluorescence um, microscopy experiment. This shows cell painting, which is our assay that we where we put six stains. Um, and they're imaged across five channels, and it reveals eight different components of the cell. But really, any experiment you're doing, if you're looking at something in the microscope with a fluorescent marker, why not add a few more and, um, and get extra measurements, um, whatever you can. So we really encourage people to use as, as many stains as they can that, that are relevant to the biological question they're asking. And as well, um, even with each individual stain, you can measure multiple features. And so... Our informal motto in the lab is to measure everything and ask questions later. There really are thousands of features that you can measure for each cell that you've imaged. Um, and if you have thousands of cells per sample, you get this enormous amount of data that is available from a single experiment. So here I'm just showing three samples. If we're doing a high throughput experiment with 100,000 samples, this would be a huge data matrix with lots of individual cells. You see their heterogeneity. You see thousands of metrics that have been measured for each individual image. And we'll get back to how do we leverage this type of data um, in, in a bit. Okay, so I want to take you through three types, uh, three waves of quantitative image analysis, um, starting from the simpler to the, uh, and moving towards the more complex. And let's begin with, with a case, a, bi a biological case where you know exactly what you want to measure in the image. So you have a pile of images, you would otherwise maybe score them by eye, but you would rather come up with an automated solution because it's either um, faster if you have a lot of images or it's um, more, more objective. So to take you through some examples, uh, I just want to point out that the software that our group writes is open source. It's called Cell Profiler. And every whenever we develop a new type of analysis, we put it into the software so that anybody can use it for free. And uh, you can publish it with your paper um, and, and share it with your, commu your community that's interested in whatever you're studying. And so some of the steps, usually the, the approach is to build a pipeline. Some of the steps are super, super trivial, like splitting the colors of a multi-channel image. Some of the steps seem like they ought to be trivial, but maybe aren't so much, with like correcting the elimination, things that might not matter so much if you're looking by eye, but do matter when you're trying to quantify. 
usually the, the challenge is usually identifying the different components that you're looking for. For most cultured cell types, this is a pretty straightforward step. Um, but, but for some, like neurons and for um, more complicated systems, this can be a bit of a challenge. And then um, lastly, once you've identified whatever you need to identify in the image, then you measure um, as many metrics as you can think of or as many as you need to, to quantify your, um, to reach your goals. So I won't talk at all about the software other than to say it's available, it's online. Um, feel free to download it and feel free to stop by um, or email me if you'd like to have, uh, to join the, the email list for tutorials that we give very, very frequently around here. So just some examples of this kind of analysis where you're measuring a simple phenotype. Um, you, can, you can count green, in this particular instance with the Hung lab, we uh, counted green blobs. Um, the green blobs here are tuberculosis that are infecting macrophages identifying a drug that um, reduces the infection rate. Um, in collaboration with the Yaffe, Yaffe lab, we identified genes that are in the DNA damage response way, pathway by counting speckles. Um, this is a very high resolution assay, so we're counting uh, DNA damage speckles within a single nucleus here. Uh, collaborations with the uh, Ozabel and Rubkin labs have um, involved C. elegans worms, uh, screens involving whole um, organisms in a multi-well plate. Um, and here we were looking for novel anti-infectives, so compounds that would cause these worms to survive an infection by a, a nasty pathogen. And lastly, um, as I described already, this uh, AMKL study. So in each of these cases, um, the biologists knew exactly what they want to measure. Please count my green blobs. Please uh, um, tell me how many of these worms are dead or alive and that sort of thing. The next um, stage of projects I want to describe is where we, um, the battle just knows what they want to score, but we need to use a combination of, of Can you features. Tell us a little bit about how those interactions are set up with the imaging platform. So, sure. you know, does the biologist design their experiment with you guys, or do they come to you when they've already done the experiment? Yes. To Great. So, the question is how, how exactly do people come and interact with the platform? It happens both ways. Um, the first is, uh, um, most commonly, people come when they just have an idea of what they want to do for a project. So if you have any inkling of some kind of microscopy-based assay you might want to do, feel free to stop by <clears throat> or, um, or contact me, um, and we're happy to give you advice and guidance about sample preparation and image acquisition, how to get the most out of an experiment, or, or alternatives that might be more appropriate than microscopy. Um, we also do get the case occasionally where people uh, are, are like, ah, the reviewers want me to quantify figure three. <laughs> I have a pile of images. Can you help me quantify this thing? Um, so we're happy to work in that fashion as well to, to help get information out of images you've already collected. So will you help people design the experiment you know, based on kind of the statistics of how many images you know you will need to Right. Uh, yep, yep. So usually it's in, um, to address the question is, um, how, how many images do you need to collect and how do you know and how, do, how, do you, how involved are we in the experimental design? Usually it's an empirical question, how many images you'll need to, um, to measure what you want to measure because it depends not just on the strength of the phenotype or the obviousness of the phenotype, but also on the error bars, the standard deviation that you're, that you're getting in your biological samples. So usually it's empirical. Usually you just have to do a pilot to figure that out. Great question. Okay, so um, moving to more complicated uh, phenotypes. Um, I'll just show some examples here, and this is where um, we have some um, convenient machine learning tools that allow you to score these different assays. Um, in this one, we were trying to distinguish these cobblestone areas from the, the more rounded cells. Um, it, you don't, you're not measuring a single feature, you're trying to describe a certain type of phenotype, and so we um, did that. that led to identifying that statins are actually a potential um, leukemic therapy. Uh, together with a Golub lab and a, and a large number of other labs here at the Broad. Second experiment with Sangeeta Bhatia's group, um, she was looking to identify these hepatocytes, which have the asterisks versus the fibroblasts. And um, her goal here was to identify compounds that can cause the hep hepatocytes to proliferate. And so recognizing the difference between those two cell types is not just a single feature, it's a combination of features that the biologist use, uses by eye, that can detect by eye. Uh, another worm project um, looking for genes that, um, that, when perturbed, alter the fat metabolism of the entire organism. And so looking for fat worms versus lean worms was not just a matter of counting up um, the, the pixel intensities of the fat, but looking at the distribution, how much was in the gut as opposed to other parts of the, of the whole organism. And then lastly, a project involving deep learning that's still ongoing. Uh, involves um, trying to identify the various malaria stages of infection in, um, in blood smears. 
right? So these are more complicated assays. Um, and I think uh, what we're, one of the things I wanted to show is kind of the, the what's at the cutting ed edge of being challenging, because I would say that up until now, um, for the vast majority of cultured mammalian cell assays, they're pretty readily solvable. So it's often the case that somebody comes to us, um, within an hour or two, we've given them a cell profiler pipeline that can quantify what they want to quantify, and you can be on your merry way um, doing your own image analysis. There's still some things that are a bit challenging, and some examples are shown here. Um, they tend to involve these more complicated uh, model systems, like tissue and, and uh, muscle cultures, and as well 3D. So um, we're working with the Allen Institute to um, uh, start uh, interrogating some of these uh, more complex 3D organoid systems. Um, so long story short, if you've got images, if you've got a microscopy-based assay, um, you should definitely come and check with us if you'd like to try to figure out how to quantify it, because these kinds of things are pretty accomplishable these days. So yeah, tissues. Um, we are doing, uh, we've done a couple of assays successfully with tissues, and they're more challenging because you don't have the, the cells in a nice little monolayer where you can really see each one. You've got uh, oblique sections of uh, various um, cells, so it's hard, it, depending on what you want to measure, it can be quite a challenge because you're not measuring full cells unless you're doing it in 3D, which adds, a, adds another layer of complication. Um, but there are a great many things that can be measured in, in tissues, and um, we've already got some successful case studies uh, that are coming from tissues. Are there any other questions about this part? Because um, I'm about to switch gears to kind of a, some, a, a set of experiments that you wouldn't think of would involve imaging. Um, so any more questions here? Okay. So, um, so now we're going to talk about um, a, a new kind of a set of experiments, which might, might be particularly relevant to this audience. And this is where you're characterizing samples, even if you don't know what phenotypes you're looking for. So you have a lot of samples. You wish you could group them, or you wish you could tell how they're different from each other. Um, but you're not necessarily sure how you'll be able to do that. Um, if you are familiar with the connectivity map, um, then this will, this will uh, be much easier for you to understand. Um, but I'll de describe it from the beginning. What is profiling as a, as a general thing? So what I've described up until now is us um, screening or scoring a particular assay. The biologist knows exactly what particular phenotype they want to look for, and they just want to they measure it, or they want to find a few hits a, in a larger screen. By contrast, profiling is where we're detecting patterns across a sample, a set of samples, and our goal is to use all the phenotypes we can. So imaging is great for this because it's so multiplex when you have multiple stains and multiple features for each stain so that when you have a number of different perturbations in your experiment, for each one of them, you do the image analysis, you get this um, beautiful matrix of data where all the cells have all these features measured, and then you can say how similar is, is sample two to sample one and, and sample three, and you can measure these similarities or correlations among all these different um, patterns. So why might you want to do this? This is where we go back to a, um, this is from connectivity map paper. Um, it allows you to connect everything. Uh, so you can connect diseases to genes, you can connect genes to other genes, you can connect compounds to other compounds, and, and across these as well. And so as, as in connectivity map, where this is done through mRNA expression profiles, here we're doing it through image-based morphological profiles. Um, so, Okay, if we don't know what phenotypes we're looking for, how do we stain the cells with, with a gene, genome expression um, assay? You just measure the entire genome. How do you measure the entire morph morphology of a cell? Well, it's not possible to do that in a single assay, but what you can do is choose judiciously a set of stains that um, kind of pack in as much information as you can into a single very inexpensive assay. And so that's what we did with this cell painting assay. Um, these particular six stains were chosen because they really um, get as much information as possible into this um, assay, and it's, uh, it's inexpensive, it's um, very high throughput, and allows us to do some pretty large um, and interesting experiments, which we'll describe. So again, before we leave this part, I want to make sure everybody really um, gets the, the gist of it, that you have some kind of perturbation that you're interested in studying. You um, plate all the cells, you stain them and image them, you do the image processing to extract thousands of features for each individual cell, and you end up with these morphological profiles um, that describe, it's basically a numerical description of the population of cells that's growing in the dish. Is there a way to do this for measurements in a more high throughput manner? The question is whether you can do the measurements in a high throughput manner? Do more measurements. More measurements. Uh, yeah, so, so this is already pretty highly multiplexed. We get about 1,400 metrics, and the question is, can we get more? And the answer is, we certainly could get more if we made 
cell painting 2.0 with another set of 16s, or if we used um, multiple different cell types, uh, multiple different time points, you could use other stressors at the same time. There's a number of um, different ways we can think of to increase the information content from, from this assay. Already we get a, a pretty, um, to me, surprising amount of information just from the single assay, but, um, but there are a number of ways one could increase it if you wanted to get more, more out of it. Okay, so um, it turns out that this, um, this basic approach of profiling is useful at every step in the drug discovery process. And so we've been doing pilot projects all over the place using cell painting and trying to speed up various stages of this. And so I'm only, we have dozens of these projects. I'm only going to describe a couple of them today. Um, and I think the first one is probably the most relevant to this audience. So um, with, cell, with profiling, with this basic strategy of profiling, we can come up with more disease-relevant assays. So we can design assays that accurately represent the disease state based on patient cell lines or disease-associated genes. So in my opinion, for every genome-wide association study that comes out of the Broad, you've got hundreds of genes that, are, um, that, that come out, hundreds of alleles that come out. Um, I think the very next step should be to um, do a, a simple experiment like cell painting and um, group all of those genes based on their functional impact on cells because it gives you a very quick overview of which pathways are involved in the, in the, um, in the disease of, of interest. And um, it allows you to prioritize quickly where, where you should go next and which ones you might want to follow up next. Um, so we'll show an example of this first um, strategy here. Let's say that you have um, two different biological states. Um, let's say one is wild type cells, the others are perturbed. It could either be a patient cell line that's associated with a disease, that's kind of the hard way. Uh, it could also be a genetic um, alteration that you know is associated with a disorder. Or it could be anything else that you are just curious to study. So it could be um, overexpressing a, MR, a miRNA um, or whatever. It could really could be anything. So you've got two different states. You run it through the cell painting assay, you extract these, um, these uh, morphological fingerprints, and then your goal here is to identify the signature of the, perturb the perturbed state. Uh, it doesn't have to be visible to the human eye, and we find most of the time it's, it's not. Uh, it's not visible. Um, there are some tricks that we have to try to, once you have a signature, to try to understand more what it means and to interpret it, but, um, but usually these are things that you would miss by eye. And once we find a difference between these two, if, if the perturbed state represents a disease state, it's now very simple to screen for compounds that can make the perturbed cells look healthy again. So let's look at a concrete example of this. This is not from my lab, but from the University of Utah, where they identified a phenotype that was associated with the knockdown of CCM2, uh, which causes a particular disorder. And it doesn't take an image analyst to tell you that there's a difference between these two states. Um, so they said, aha, we, we know this uh, loss of function of this gene causes a disorder, and apparently the cells respond in some fashion. So let's find drugs that can cause cells that look like this to go back to looking like this. That's what they did. Um, they screened for drugs to revert the phenotype. They found some. And what I think is really interesting about this, um, ask, uh, about this, this study is that they, they, found, they, they screened for drugs in two ways. Number one was they had the expert biologists who had been studying this disease for 10 years select a set of drugs that they thought best reverted the, um, the disease state. And then they had the automated methods um, uh, choose a set of drugs that, that best reflected the, numerically which, um, which the, the reversion was most complete. And they found that the drugs chosen based on the automated analysis outperformed those chosen by experts in their subsequent disease models and mouse models. And in fact, um, uh, they launched a company that is now putting these into clinical trials. Uh, in our own lab, we are taking this approach um, with some mental illnesses, which, as you may know, there are no molecular um, diagnoses for, for these kinds of disorders. There's no blood test for it. But what we are finding is that when we have um, patient cell lines for disorders, uh, for patients with um, disorders, they are uh, yielding particular phenotypes that are um, distinguishable. Um, and so we're very excited to follow this up and potentially do drug screens on those kinds of cases. Um, and the last one I really want to focus on before we um, finish up with questions is, um, is the idea of doing more personalized assay, and, and this may be more relevant to this crowd as just a general approach for understanding um, the functions of various genetic perturbations. So this particular um, cancer program collaboration with Matt Meyerson's group and a, a number of others involves lung cancer. And here, uh, we're just looking at BRAF alleles that are known to be associated with uh, lung cancer. When you overexpress each of these alleles in this random cell, uh, lung cancer cell type, 
run it through the cell painting assay, you get these really nice correlation matrices where um, this group of BRAF alleles looks like each other, this group looks like each other, um, the wild type BRAF is down here, looks like negative controls. And an experiment like this lets you, this is what I'm talking about doing downstream of, of genome-wide association studies, um, an experiment like this allows you to very quickly see that um, if you have if you have a mutation in a particular pathway, if this is your tumor, it would be very useful to run it through an assay like this so that you know, um, does my tumor behave more like BRAF V600E, for which, there's a, for which there's a therapy, or does it behave more like this, uh, these mutations up here for which there might be a different therapy, or sadly, maybe no therapy? I would like to know where, um, where my um, particular mutation falls before getting some kind of treatment. And so we think this kind of a, approach um, at the level of individual mutations, but also just at the level of, of understanding gene function more generally um, could be very useful. So in this experiment, we have 100 or so um, genes, all different kinds of genes, mostly cancer-related, um, chosen from the cancer program uh, to be from different pathways. And what we find is this cell painting assay it has sufficient information to group um, different genes based on their, their pathways. So this is the hippo pathway right here, for example. We have all these BRAF um, alleles and, and wild types up there, um, and, and a, a number of other examples of, of different um, genes clustering based on their phenotypic similarity. So that's what I really wanted to focus on today. There's a number of other things um, in this pipeline that you might find interesting. A lot of them involve um, chemical-chemical similarities, um, trying to match uh, compounds to particular genetic um, perturbations and so on. Basically, um, uh, there's just so many things that you can do taking this approach. And again, if you're familiar with connectivity map, um, many of the experiments that you've seen there, would you would find um, have quite similar parallels using cell painting. And in fact, we're, our goal is to combine the mRNA and cell painting data. Um, so if you're interested in reading more, there's a, a, a review article uh, that we wrote about the applications of image-based profiling. Um, and with that, I would like to thanks, thank you for your attention and take any questions. Thank you.